This episode and every episode of LedgerCast is brought to you by Brave New Coin. Go to ledgerstatus.com slash BNC to check out everything that Brave New Coin's got going on. Whether you're looking for great market commentary or newsletters, which you can subscribe to right from their homepage, you can also check out BNC Pro, which is a new suite of tools. It's a piece of software that you can log into to easily manage your crypto activities. Uh, it's a secure and unified suite of applications that you can use to research, chart, screen, analyze, report, optimize, and much more. The wait list is open now so that you can uh, hop on and be notified when it's ready for you. Thank you to Brave New Coin for being a LedgerCast partner. Again, go to ledgerstatus.com slash BNC to check them out. Hello and welcome to LedgerCast. My name is Brian Krogsgaard, and today I have a very special guest, Marguerite uh, de Corsell. She is very busy in the crypto space, has been in the crypto space forever. Um, I think I saw a note that you made one of your first games, Marguerite, in 2014 or something like that, uh, yeah. using color coins. So welcome to the show, and I'm excited to have you here. Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, yeah, so we're going to... Well, I want to get your input. Say that my uh, my handle. Did you say coin artist was my handle? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You're known as coin artist, as is what people should know. <laughs> um, so yeah, I forget. A lot of people are better known by their by their handles in this space. So uh, your coin artist on Twitter. Uh, you've been up to a whole bunch of stuff over the past couple of years. Um, the thing that spawned uh, this episode, even though I've been hoping to have you on for, I think, a year and a half or so, um, and I'm really pleased to finally have you. And um, you you did a painting uh, several years ago that was solved last year, and it was a puzzle painting. So can you talk a little bit about um, what it means to, uh, to the way you put this puzzle together, um, and then what is actually being auctioned off? Because you're auctioning off the physical painting, but the puzzle that was in the painting has been solved, correct? Correct. Yep. Um, so th I created this particular painting in 2015. It's called Torched Hearts. It was the conclusion for a series of um, puzzles or interactive art pieces that were online um, that I launched on Bitcoin Talk and on Reddit. And um, typically how these experiences go went is there's what we call a trailhead. And the trailhead has the initial piece, which acts like a portal. So in it, it has some sort of like gateway to an, either another website, which contains further information or um, I'm trying to remember, I think in this piece, it was a comment on a Bitcoin magazine article that came out about the, the uh, treasure hunt that was prior to this. So was the trail where the trailhead was? It actually wasn't that effective of a trailhead, and we had to like really point it out on Bitcoin. Talk. Steer people there. Yeah, um, but but anyway, like the the best trailheads are art pieces. So I learned that from this experience. Um, but anyways, as it so people went started looking into it, and um, in this case, the initial first phase of the the treasure hunt was all on the blockchain. So we did things like we hid, I, I, I kind of forget how we did this because it was back in 2014 was the beginning of the, the treasure hunt, but um, we hid information in the white space of, I think, like fake addresses on the blockchain. So we would send like transactions to fake addresses and in the white okay. space of these it might have been it might have been somewhere else and i can't remember exactly how we did it but it was just really fun because there was white space on the blockchain <laughs> that had information encoded information and once you figured out what that was it led you to like this next step um and so this went on for a year and then um and then things kind of in my life just went upside down and we had to put everything on hold so um we took a break and put a big timer up on a web page. So everybody that caught up to that spot had access to a private forum and um, they were sharing information because not everybody had made it all the way through. So at that point then in on Easter 2015, I worked with um, an engineer, uh, his name is Rob Myers. And I came up with the design and then uh, worked with Rob on how we could encode the information via how I was thinking. I was thinking about the concept of this art piece, which has 
it's based on the po- like Shakespearean poem, The Phoenix and the Turtle, the meaning of turtle mm-hmm. dove. Um, and it's this very mysterious poem that, um, that he created in a very mysterious volume of poems. Um, and, and it's supposed to be, it's supposed to point to something about Queen Elizabeth, like she's the Phoenix, and then some love that she had, some great love, uh, who was like a knight, and that is the turtle. And that's why in the, there's also a queen and, and a knight piece in the uh, in the art piece. But so it's, it's a funeral pyre. And so that's why there's flames around the border. And I was thinking that that would be a great spot to put the, the key, the Bitcoin private key. And there are Greek keys in the corner, which tell you how to read. And so on the, if, if anyone was looking at this art piece, there's like um, an inner border and then an outer border and the inner border of the flames that's wrapping around. And then it wraps back around on the outer border, but you have to turn it. So the way you read it is you read it, you go around on the inner border and then it inverses and you read it on the outer border. Um, you would have to try to figure out where the starting point is. Cause I don't directly point out where the starting point is, but it was in the information that was encoded. So if you ended up transcribing it properly, you would get um, a series of words, which was in this case, um, truth, beauty, and rarity, rarity, truth, and beauty, some, those three words. And um, it would be like the indicator, which was from context from the poem that you had, you were like on track because it would have been really easy to have multiple, like multiple mistakes in your, decoding like of information yeah that's what baffles me because it's like the number of steps that are required and the the right order because you're you're doing there's so much required in the with the person that ended up solving this who's remained anonymous but uh, they they uh, there's a vice article that did a great job of describing this this puzzle solvers process and described what you talked about and it seems like a lot of people ended up not realizing that the flames being the key was where you needed to start and that's what might have prevented people from solving this for so long because it took three years right the puzzle was known and then they knew there was you would put almost five bitcoin in this thing so it's a nice bounty to solve it and it just took forever well so um a couple things happened i had put four like four point what was it, 4.8 Bitcoin in it uh, back in 2014 in the wallet address, Mm -hmm. knowing that that was going to be the grand prize puzzle address. Um, And during the course of those three years in which people are trying to solve it, they, um, a hacker, because it's one of the most watched addresses, so a hacker sent some Bitcoin from an address that he had somehow come and access to, like there was some sort of exploit somewhere and he was able to seize somebody's wallet but he was trying to let people know anonymously that he had this wallet and was trying to find the owner so what he did was he sent a transaction to this address like a small transaction which brought the balance up to five bitcoin Uh and the owner of that wallet eventually via uh somebody noticed this happen and contacted me and i put them in touch somehow put these people in touch and (laughs) over Reddit and um, the owner of that original wallet wanted to keep the Bitcoin in this address as a, as a thank you, because it, he did have like something like 10 Bitcoin or something like that in the original address. That's um, awesome. So it started at 4.87 and then rounded up from you matchmaking a lost Bitcoin wallet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, uh, um, well, there was like some sort of, so in uh, the Bitcoin space, like people will generate addresses that are not secure. Um, there's some software still out there that you can generate an address that isn't secure. And it's easy for bots to basically, um, they're, what's it called? Um, that bots are watching and then they're siphoning Bitcoin out of mm. if any wa- transactions go into those wallets. And apparently this one was, ha- it hadn't happened yet, but it was on like on a list or um, mm. had some sort of vulnerability like that. Um, so that's how that happened. But anyway, Anyways, that the author of that Vice article that when this was solved, that wrote that article, he had written that previous article about um, what is going on with these siphoning of Bitcoin wallets um, about about this piece. So yeah, it was just really interesting. You know how Twitter, crypto Twitter is like it's just amazing, like how much activity actually goes on that's um, directly related to our space. 
um, yeah, like such, such as that. Yeah. Like getting, getting in touch with me about a hack on my Twitter. Um, anyway, <laughs> <laughs> um, you put in a, you put in a quote in that vice article that it was the painting was created during the toughest part of the bear market. And those original bitcoins that you loaded into that address were half of everything you had in your name. It was essentially a prayer that things would get better. Um, so you put, you know, half the Bitcoin you had in the world into this painting. And, uh, it sounds like at the time, like, you know, maybe financially it was not, um, not like what logic would tell you to do, uh, when you could, you know, spend them or whatever. So, um, what, what led you to that and what you, what brought you kind of out of that, out of that phase of life to, um, and to move on and get to all the things that you ended up doing in this space. So uh, I guess like for me, um, that, so that particular poem is, it's a, like I said, it was a, I think it's called like a funeral march, uh, but mm -hmm. death pair. And it ends with, uh, the Phoenix dying with this turtle dub and everybody in the audience is just basically praying that they'll return to life. But that's it. Like you don't hear that there's a resurrection. You don't hear about, you know, it comes back to life. It's just left with, you don't know if the it's going to make it, it's going to make it back. And so for me, I felt like that really resonated because I didn't think it, this wasn't the end for me. This was just maybe there's a quote by JK Rowling that, you know, rock bottom is the foundation on which she built their future or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. which is something I leaned on to during the time she had been a single mom. I was a single mom during this time period and, um, just trying to find my way. And so, um, so I think that, the, I mean, I work, so I didn't have money to go out. So this is what I was working on, like in the nighttime when the kids were sleeping yeah. and, um, I was in a new location. I didn't have a ton of friends. Um, I had my online friends. But I was trying to figure out what skill sets I had that I could get full time job. And as a single mom, trying to get a full time job that also pays for daycare um, mm -hmm. is like it's really tough. Um, so and e and then even trying to go get interviews when you have people that are under school age and you don't have family like helping, it makes it pretty challenging. Um, and to, for you to run out and do interviews and things like that because you have to do a bajillion interviews before I mean and make relationships before you really get hired. Um, yeah, absolutely. As, as you, yeah, you usually hire people you know generally or people you've been referred to. It's not like cold calling doesn't usually work. So um, I was trying to figure out like from everything I'd been working on, my art and marketing, you know, what skills that I had that I could be hired with. And you know, honestly, um, what I didn't realize is the open source community, uh, which I had been working in then for about two years, making relationships in that space, um, and it was a bear market, so all these crypto companies were destroyed. It's not like there was hiring opportunities in that space at the time. Um, mm -hmm. But by just keeping my head up and continuing to work on the things I was passionate about, making really continuing to build relationships, uh, when things turned around for crypto, I had still these opportunities then, and the educate I had educated myself on a lot of different projects in the space that I thought were interesting, um, that I could contribute then. To, and eventually that led to being employed by some of these like communities, uh, starting out as community managers to becoming um, head of marketing. And it's, it just took a different type of person. You can, you can't take a, a marketing agency that does traditional marketing and throw them into an open source project and get the result that you're looking for. Generally, a lot of these projects, the successful ones that build up really great organic communities have a grassroots sort of background with the people that are behind the projects. Yeah, and you did that with uh, Decred? Mm -hmm. Did it with Decred. I don't know if you ever heard of like Jumbucks, which became Ubik. Um, mm -hmm. There's been a lot of projects that uh, have that sort of ethos and have done really well for themselves. Um, yeah, I was really lucky to have that opportunity at Decred and the community there is pretty awesome um, and made some great friends. And then so from there I had the opportunity, I didn't have to fund these prizes anymore. Now people were offering me funds to put into these educational. So these original works were less educational and more art driven, like more art story and fun blockchain tricks. 
<laughs> that we could do. But um, mm-hmm. but then eventually it became like a decred. Okay, let's package this up so it's more of an onboarding educational experience. So when the community walks through the challenges and they hear about it, they just learned about, um, let's say, proof of stake, proof of work, or how to interact with some of the software products that decred is producing and now has a better understanding of it. So that was more of the uh, incentive for us to create. And we did some really fun works like that, that people really loved. And it educated this community base to now either build or understand how to talk about it (coughs) and understand the vision of the project. And um, because we would tie vision in with a lot of the product. So um, yeah, go ahead. What inspired you to combine these things? Um, because, you know, you obviously had an interest in art, I assume, from an earlier age. Um, and then you brought that to puzzle making. Were you already interested in puzzles or was it the type of thing where you thought, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm in this blockchain community and like we can t- make it into a puzzle? Like, where did that combination come from? Because that's I'm sure there are huge communities that I don't know anything about. Uh, where this is popular, but to me, it's just like the way it all comes together is baffling. And, um, and even in the world of, uh, you know, crypto puzzles, like you're like the top person in this realm, but are there a lot of other people doing this type of stuff? Uh, there have been other people now, like, so our community attracted a ton of puzzle makers that then they'll produce little pieces for, let's say maybe there's going to be a series over October like last year our community did a Halloween series and we just then get behind them and use our marketing and our network to push their, their creations forward. Um, so that, because that's one of the best parts is when you create something, you want people to interact with it and play with it. Um, it's really sad if you create something and nobody cares and nobody, it doesn't get any retweets, nobody looks at it. Um, so yeah, so we help bring visibility to create content creators like that. Um, so naturally, our community is full of a bunch. And then there's, um, the, what is it, Block Cities? Block Cities has teamed up with Marble Cards. And I think right now they have some sort of treasure hunt going on. That's kind of a similar thing. And they did a like a crypto puzzle challenge during Consensus this year in New York City, which was fun. Um, there's, there's a few different projects that are realizing the potential of like that interactive medium of uh, crypto puzzles because it's it's basically like gaming without needing well sometimes you can build an application but you don't necessarily have to have an application for it it can be static yeah well and how the digital you know how digital currency works it can live physically in the physical world by in multiple different ways be it a qr code be it some other way of encoding the information um but same online so you can have a dynamic cross um, real world, virtual world experience that bounces you around at different locations. I think, um, I think block cities was doing some geocaching. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure they were doing some geocaching, which I've always thought was really interesting and how like geocaching kind of crosses into that physical virtual realm, um, with, especially with crypto. So, so yeah, people are definitely experimenting. Um, I'm really interested in, have you heard of crypto voxels? No, I haven't. So crypto voxels in Decentraland, they are virtual worlds, but they they're kind of have a sandbox sort of, um, I guess they're like sandbox games in a way where you're just building content out of blocks. And I imagine that in these open worlds, people are going to be building things like puzzles and um, mm. mysterious, I guess, spaces. Um, if you look at, uh, what was it? There's... Um, So I guess my I got started because of well I loved gaming and I loved art. Um, did you ever play Myst or like? I know of it. I'm a horrible gamer. Uh, <laughs> I can appreciate it, but I also know if I ever really did it as an adult, I would probably just dive all in and want to spend all my time lost in some game. Um, mm-hmm. So I well, haven't played much since I was a kid. That's kind of the point of why. So. People spent hours on these puzzles and what they walked away from was on my puzzles and what they walked away from was education, some piece of education and only a few, if not one person walked away with the monetary incentive. 
we did design some of them so that each phase unlocked money or like if you unlocked a level you got a, a bot auto sent you a like a trophy type token with one of our experiences we build on counterparty um so we were trying to help people and incentivize them and reward them through that interaction but what happened with ethereum is so ethereum the big idea is that they're programmable tokens so basically as you do something you don't need a bot to send or do things on behalf of a application it's all built in into the experience so when you craft two items you get item a item b you get item c and that's an action that you're doing as a player and then you get this end result which captures the value of your crafting um essentially, but you can take that idea and blow that up that if you walk through certain challenges or accomplish certain um, tasks within the game, that then you unlock things, traits, attributes, characteristics about your character who is now token backed and can evolve via the gameplay. So these programmable tokens means you can have token evolution um, with both, both material equipment gear uh, and, and characters. So, and, and so that that's a direct way to reward people for their gameplay. So I also similarly had experiences of blowing hundreds of hours in games and then realizing, okay, I'm done with this game. Now I'm going to start over in a whole new game, which is going to be a whole, like a time sink. And while I love exploring these virtual worlds and solving pu the puzzles that are in them and there's story and there's entertainment value, it doesn't actually like improve my quality of living, which is now possible with virtual currency. Um, or token back to assets, game assets. So now the fact that your actions can translate into value directly, especially when it's skill based, then that changes that can that can have a giant impact on a lot of what we do online or in applications. Historically, the most I'd ever really heard about were people basically selling logins and stuff where they had built up some character, but they were done with the game, so they were trying to extract value from a character in that way, which was probably against terms of ser uh, terms of service and stuff too, right? Yep. So um, you would get in trouble. If, I mean, that's your that's your um, right. So these these game companies don't like they don't approve of that behavior, and so yeah. you're at risk of spending that money buying these things and then getting your account seized, which happened all the time. Ninja actually got in trouble with Epic. Um, he didn't do anything wrong, but he did something that flagged the network. And so he had all of his digital assets, and we're talking about sponsored, donated assets, things he won in tournaments that were seized out of his account. And there's a hundred thousands of dollars of of, um, wow. of items, and they were and destroyed, like he, like they were gone. He couldn't he couldn't get them back, even after they found out what had happened. To give you an example of just how much education I need in this space is that uh, I just learned about Ninja the other day <laughs> <laughs> because of this thing where Twitch was putting some junk on his pre prior channel because he moved over to some other streaming service. Um, I want to close the loop on Torched Hearts before we dig more into to, to how this concept of creating value in games led you to blockade games. Um with Torch Tarts, this is an NFT and on its own, right? Like there's a digital version of this that the person will have keys to, and then they also will get the physical painting that has been in your home. So you're you're gonna send this to someone. Yep, that's right. So um, the final, so the auction concludes on Sunday, and I think I'm gonna do a live stream and um, maybe have people on. Maybe you wanna help me with this. Possibly, I don't know. I've never done this so far, <laughs> but do a live stream where I have different friends that have helped on different puzzles and talk about um, those works. And then um, during, because what happens is when the auction concludes, there's like a five minute rolling window of when you're for one more bid. And when we did a, a previous sale, I think it went on for maybe 30 minutes before this, it finally concluded and the, the, um, the five minutes overlapped. So, wow. um, so, so if I mean, people keep yeah. bidding every five minutes, then it'll just keep going. Right. Exactly. And, um, another thing is that people, um, they generally don't start bidding until right at the end because, mm -hmm. you know, they don't want to shoot themselves in the foot by trying to drive up the price too early. Yeah. So, so right uh, now at the time of recording, not like you said, it's two days out. This is basically like the intro 
uh, bidding. Is that 12.5 Ethereum that's mm -hmm. bid so far? Okay. So there's, uh, it's already going for a couple thousand dollars, but just a fraction of a percentage of the Bitcoin that was in the painting. Of course, they won't get that Bitcoin. The puzzle solver got that already. Um, but they will get to date. Uh, I think was this the largest reward that was in a in a crypto puzzle to date? The fi roughly fifty thousand yeah. dollars. Yeah. So someone well, will get the physical version of that. At one time, so I think another reason why it sparked interest. So the solver, he is in a country where it's not, um, it's not completely. It's kind of like a gray area if you're allowed to have cryptocurrency or not. And so that's why he wanted to remain anonymous. I ended up working with him on other works. Um, that's other cool. puzzles and i don't know if you heard of the pineapple arcade we had a whole bunch of puzzles in there um yeah was like crypto they're like crypto meme eight bit video games that uh the games had little like easter eggs which unlocked crypto prizes but he worked on some of that um there is so there's like a pineapple rubrics cube in there he helped build that mm -hmm. um that's awesome he was an engineer yeah he was really cool and and i don't only, i don't think he charged for a lot of that work either he just was helping out um and so at the peak i think of the bull run back in 2017 or maybe it was january 2018 it was this piece i think hit something like a hundred thousand dollars um in value yeah. yeah yeah that would have been about right yeah because <laughs> it was twenty thousand dollars bitcoin yeah, yeah about 000. 20 and then the five bitcoin yep and so um that had a lot of that i guess brought it to life all of a sudden people were really working on trying to solve this um, it was a whole new, a whole new uh, iteration of uh, interest, and I, I think what's interesting to me. So this is, I'm gonna pitch your physical piece because now what we have is um, an auction for a piece of uh, art that start physical art that also has this uh, blockchain based puzzle in it, one of the first of its kind, the highest value of its kind. If I think of this r relative to like the traditional art world, this is fascinating to me because we don't know how big this is going to be in the future. Like this could be gigantic in terms of an industry, a segment of the art world. Um, and this is kind of a seminal piece for uh, showcasing what's possible between digital art and physical art. And someone can own the physical piece. Like there's a there's a argument that this could be an incredible investment for someone in its own right. Um, and I just want to toot your horn on that and make my own opinion known that the current bid seems very low <laughs> in terms of uh, what this could end up going for, especially compared to some of the art I've seen that's been auctioned in the in the regular world and has none of this additional interest in it in terms of um, the blockchain integrations and the puzzles and all that stuff. So I think it's super cool. Um, I want to note where it is. So it's at OpenSea.io which is, uh, this is a marketplace. I saw that they went through Techstars at the same time as you. So this is some folks that you know? Well, they didn't go through Techstars. They went through Y Combinator um, a year prior oh, okay. to that. So But they were here in New York um, when we were going through it. And so they helped directly on some of our different sales and integrations we did. Okay. I saw them on a one of the videos that I was looking up. Uh, you did some kind of co-presentation or something like that. I, yeah. I realized, It seemed like y'all knew each other is the point. Yeah. Um, yeah, so OpenSea is a, a marketplace of NFTs or non-fungible tokens uh, and a bunch of art. They've got Decentraland stuff and CryptoKitties and marble cards and all sorts of stuff. I have no idea what a, a lot of this is, um, but you are one of the featured um, featured pieces on the site. And so people can basically just go to OpenSea.io or hit the show notes and I will link straight to Torch Tarts, which is super cool. Um, I hope this thing goes for fortunes. Um, I think it's just a really neat, a really neat showcase. Whether you're an enterprise fund manager or a retail trader, buying and selling cryptocurrencies successfully requires price discovery you can rely on. Brave New Coins Liquid Indices provide trusted US dollar prices for Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Ripple. Featuring end of day or intraday outputs, you can count on the BLX, ELX, and XRPLX for accurate US dollar pricing for smart contract oracles, settlement price discovery, net asset valuation, and performance analysis. Visit bravenewcoin.com to find out more. 
all of this experience, eventually you said, you know what, I want to turn these skills that I've developed, my knowledge of the blockchain ecosystem, my art, and you turned it into a game company. Um, when was that process? I know you've been really ramping it up over the last year, but when did you get started with forming the idea for what became Blockade Games? So in 2017, um, I helped on a few different projects do like some just some marketing. And myself and the lead artist, we started producing a bunch of cyberpunk related artwork because it seemed to really resonate with the crypto community. And and Diego and I, just the artist and I, um, really just had a lot of fun starting to imagine this like cyberpunk dystopian world, which I think I don't I don't know if you're familiar with uh, books like Snow Crash. Or, um, or Ready Player One. Um, Ready Player One mm -hmm. is not cyberpunk, but but Blade Runner is is um, the movie. <laughs> of them, the Ready Player One is the one that I read. Uh, but yeah, those ideas I'm, I'm I definitely understand. Yeah, and like Diamond Age. Um, so Neil Stevenson in general, or Neuromancer is another book. Um, yeah, and and we just like it felt like that could be in the way that we have all these different coins popping up, and it's almost like they have um a culture all to themselves like an online and it feel in a dystopian feature it's kind of similar in that you have all these different corporations that you know the government is kind of blurred and everything is just a little bit messy nobody really knows how anything works anymore there's a little bit of every man for himself but and things are edgy but um but it's still exciting with technology and and uh so we just kind of fell into that genre and started imagining what a world like just started world building, I guess, in 2017 and then producing concept pieces. And we realized that we after we had done an online game. I don't know if you saw that, like pink bot poker, like war game that we made. Yeah. yeah. And then yeah. we made a um, online dungeon crawler during Halloween too, where people would be interacting with this bot and it would ask you, you know, what, it had forking choices and what next choice would you want to make? And you, you say proceed. And if you keep proceeding, um, the prize gets bigger, but then if you fall into a trap or a monster gets you or something, then you lose everything. And so you could choose to exit and run away. But so we put this on Twitter, um, and it was a pretty big success, except Twitter, uh, just is not made like, it's not the platform for gaming. And, mm -hmm. um, and so we realized that, okay, what, if we wanted to make our dream game, and this is of course leading into the bull run where now we have a little bit of extra cash. Um, if we could do anything we want right now, what would we want to do? And the first thing that we thought of was a cyberpunk RPG it would be really cool. I was a big Final Fantasy fan and little did I know what I was getting myself into at the time. <laughs> <laughs> and it would have been much easier to have pivoted into something simpler, or just like a, just a wet, even just a simple mobile game. But we like wanted to showcase the beautiful art and token back at CryptoKitties was just happening. And a lot of our strengths were we had blockchain engineers. We had amazing art talent. Uh, we had a lot of creatives and we were pretty good at um, coming up. Like we were pretty good with shipping in general. So, mm -hmm. um, but we had to spend a year basically building a platform that would coincide with a game design that would support basically an open economy. And I had to learn to, I mean, it was very educational for me because I didn't understand the different challenges of game design in general and how complicated it is. So a year on the initial game design, so 2018 was all platform development and game design pretty much and art production too in the background, but, um, and which is also time consuming. But anyway, so then 2019 has been taking that and, and putting all the pieces together um, the game design has continued to be iterated on um, the different monetization vectors and the opportunities for players basically to create value through different functions of the game. Um, and then also the art part. So I'm pretty passionate about digital art and it's been hard for digital artists to monetize their work. Um, and so now that you can token back it and it's, I, it's provable on a platform that that is the correct digital art piece that now has utility in your game, um, you can't fake that. So like someone couldn't mint a whole bunch of these art pieces and use that same art file, our platform wouldn't recognize that as the legitimate uh, art piece in, in the game. Mm. It would need to be the one that was the correct token. Um, 
And that's something that we can then support each other across games. So interoperability of these tokens and what it means to have a provable asset. Um, yeah, so I'm probably going completely down a rabbit hole here, but um, but well, it's uh, a, it's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, but so things have been so we had to in it was um, summer 2018 that I started really bringing in industry veterans. Um, we brought in the the big game designers. We had done a few different iterations of game design of what we thought we wanted to make, and we had to throw that away we kept building it and then throwing it away and then we kept building the platform for this game design and then throwing it away because it wasn't we just, it was like running into a wall um and then the, the 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 pros started getting into the space and uh we were really lucky I, I don't know if you know this but bitcoin has a ton of pro poker players in the community yeah. from the early days and some of that is because um well one playing online it's really hard to play with actual cash um mm -hmm. and two historically um poker players are known to have their accounts frozen if they're involved right. in anything like online gambling so via friends that were um have been bitcoin ogs and uh known not only pro poker players but pro magic the gather players that also were game designers from uh like from california that have worked on big big games like um our designers worked on the World of Warcraft trading card game, which is now known as Hearthstone, and worked with Richard Garfield, who's the creator of Magic the Gathering, um, and other other games like uh, worked at Daybreak. Uh, our, and now our our uh, project manager worked on H one Z one, which is one of the first battle royale games that created that genre. Um, that that's awesome. Off. Yeah, I mean, so we have and, and Chris uh, Chapman, he's our game, our executive producer. He worked at Disney for ten years. He had a um, MMO marketplace that was acquired by by Disney, um, and he worked with like just our talent now is is ridiculous. And, and but that that didn't happen <laughs> yeah. overnight. Those right. we, it took a while of you know built, this is the idea, this is what we're building, and then showing it to people that then had this background and themselves falling in love with the idea and the passion and the mission. And so they would so then one of them would come on, and then after that they would look at the team, see these other people, and then the next person would join um yeah and now we're at a place where people are asking if they can join the company which is pretty cool i mean i mean people That's wanted to join cool. before but people with like big you know game chops wanting to join and join so it. this idea just started to click with people um one of my questions about neon district in particular so like you said y'all are pretty good at shipping i think that's another statement because um you know, I would think, oh, yeah, they're working on this Neon District thing. And then all of a sudden I was like, see these announcements and, hey, we built this thing called Plasma Bears. And I'm like, what the heck is this? <laughs> and it's, yeah. you know, your own, uh, it's a marketplace, but it's these, uh, it's these little cute little bears that are uh, each their own little digital art pieces. And then you uh, put out announcements about Pineapple Arcade, um, which is an enormous amount of, artwork but it's also uh puzzles and and games of its own and it seemed like maybe these were some um some ways to just test different ideas or maybe some of the platform type of stuff that you were working on um but you just shipped a ton of stuff were yeah. these used as recruitment tools or test beds what was the strategy in releasing those two other games while you're working on this gigantic rpg well so actually um we launched a game company in january 2018 and that like officially um and my puzzle was solved february 2018 and at that time it was so it made a big splash a big noise and at the time pine uh from the pineapple fund was giving away 50 million dollars in uh to charity in bitcoin and um he found me on bitcoin talk on this thread and responded, hey, I'd really like to give you guys some Bitcoin to build some puzzles with um, as prizes. And I talked to, so we got in touch with each other. And Pine's completely anonymous anyway, so it was really fun to talk with him. Um, I came up with a game plan and strategy. He wanted me to make a, another like handmade painting. Mm -hmm. But I, had, I tried to explain to him like the process of doing that is, I mean, a couple months at least. Because you first have to come up with the concepts, the design. And then if I have to make it on top of my normal workload, that's just, that would, it would just be 
it would be a slow process. And he wanted it to be re- like in a month. <laughs> so, yeah. so I pulled all, of, we had a, a large like R and D part of our com- company, which is a heavily community based. So I pulled all these people in together. Um, we did like quick, basically a quick hiring more just contract work of people and, and uh, delegating some different tasks. So the idea was this arcade and everybody would have this different cabinet. Like this cabinet is going to be this theme, this theme and this theme. One of them, for example, is a, um, like a cryptocurrency themed Pac-Man essentially. And, um, and someone went then and worked on that and made it. And we, and so a lot of, I think every game in there was made by a different individual. Um, and then Diego was nice. working on the art pieces so all of that was put together in a month. So that it's not it's not optimal at the moment. It's you know it loads slow. Um, we haven't really given it a ton of love, but it got the job done. But it's out there. Yeah, it's out there. And then people would play. And then there were also these uh, trophies, like these non fungible token trophies that if you played uh, and won a puzzle, you would get this non fungible token. And so that those tokens mean something to the core community members that have been around since that time supporting the project. Um, like for example, it gives them access to, uh, secret content on our discord channels that you wouldn't otherwise have access to or, uh, forums and also different builds of the neon district game as we ship them. Uh, they also, they have access to a bunch of, a, a bunch of our community members have access to our back channels of development. Um, so yeah, they are building up that relationship with everyone. But so then plasma bears happened, I'd say January, 2019. Uh, so we've been working, like I said, we worked on Neon District for about a year. Then everything was heads down on um, the the platform and then the game design. And so, and, and also, by the way, that like the, the figuring out how to do an art pipeline for a game is is ridiculous. <laughs> like, you don't even know totally what you're building yet, but you still need art pretty quickly. And we weren't outsourcing. We were doing everything in-house. Um because we were really passionate about the art. And when you say fun. art pipeline, you're talking about designing characters, designing Rigs. maps or, or yep. yeah. animations, backgrounds, how, um, like, especially if you're thinking about these, that these are tokens and you want to customize a character. Let's say you want to now have a character that has a, like a, a robotic arm. Um, so mm-hmm. how do you swap out that arm uh, to, to upgrade it to a robot arm and yeah and, so there's and a programmatic don't... framework for all these different limbs and pieces and parts of well and the art character and so too like w- at what point does it is the arm cut off and where does that start where <laughs> yeah. it begin and like these other future designs how many robotic arms are there going to be you know how are they different how does that fit into the game design and the crafting it's just it gets it's, it's like a giant enigma um and we had made the decision early on that we didn't want to be, we didn't want to do a 3D game because it was going to be, it was going to be too expensive to do a 3D game. And it was going to be, it would, basically it makes it three times longer. So hmm. we could have three times the amount of game and gameplay and art if we did, if we went 2D. Um, and the budget, right? The budget is three times more for a 3D game. Yeah. So um, if, if not more than that. So anyway, so we um, made the decision for TD, and so we're really playing up the graphic. I don't, I don't know if you're familiar with the game Darkest Dungeons, but it's a, it's a 3D game or a 2D game that's very much uh, like comic book style ink, like black ink, and it heavily relies on the fact that it's a beautiful 2D art. It doesn't try uh, art game, it doesn't try to be something different. Um, so we embrace that same sort of ethos as well. But um, oh, I was going to tell you something else. I think I forgot what was what was the you were asking something uh just plasma in terms bears. of plasma bears. yeah yeah so then plasma bears um so as we were doing that for 2019 so plasma bears is um the, we had the platform built and the exciting part about the platform was it's a it, it's a free-to-play game it's on layer two blockchain tech uh parent, right now it's, the parent chain is ethereum uh we use loom network for our own blockchain um and we had so we had the servers the the uh, blockchain, the application, and we built Plasma Bears. We got the concept for it end of November because we wanted to start playing with our platform, but Neon District wasn't going to be ready for some time, and we didn't want to show Neon District art uh, too early, so we didn't want to play with mm. that part. So we had to develop something new that was quick. So these bears, it's basically like build a bear where you can craft all these different bear parts, compose in it, bundles the tokens together, 
but you can swap out the different bear parts and upgrade through the gameplay. And the gameplay is text adventure. So you send a bear out in a quest. He has traits and uh, characteristics, and he even has a personality, and they're animated. Um, but it's passive gameplay. So it's time-based. They go on a quest. It takes, let's say, 10 minutes. Um, and that difficulty changes according to how you know uh, the bear's level and what he's good at doing. Um, and, and then it will come back. Uh, from that quest and be successful or not you continue you have like a series of these and at the end of a of a quest he'll have a like a bear part prizes for for the bear um and something fun we did is the the skins of the bear are animated like gifs so mm-hmm. um we could ship lots of different fun textures and we made that mini art pipeline which is not actually that many it was actually pretty complicated but we still did it really fast did it in like a month um ship the game in january and the one of the best and coolest parts about this is, and it's still up, it's plasmabears.com. Um, mm-hmm. You just need a username, password, and then you're playing. And you're it's completely free. You're minting NFTs. Um, you're having this experience. You're building up your inventory. And let's say you make a bear that's pretty cool and you want to sell it. We have the gateway there for you to transfer your bear to Ethereum mainnet. And you could see it now for sale on OpenSea. And you could potentially, if you had never played uh, or never had any crypto, this could be one of your first opportunities to earn some Ethereum. Wow. Um, and we had children playing, we had grandparents playing. If people, it was just the fact that if you abstract away the notoriously terrible blockchain user experience, which is like download MetaMask or some other wallet, right. sync these things up. Uh, it, like, And now every time you're playing, it costs you money uh, for like to, because it's a transaction on the Ethereum mainnet, and now everything is slow. So in our game, you can basically you bundle a bear real quick. You can take it apart. You could, and there's no lag. Um, you can ship things peer to peer over social media. So I could I could make you a customized ledger status bear, and then <laughs> make fifty of them. We could make fifty of them. I could give them to you, and you could gift them away to different people on social media, and people can just claim them via username and password, and that's it. Like as a, that's awesome. Now they have their first like uh, blockchain asset. Yeah, that's extremely cool. Um, you said it's username, password, free to play, and that's a model, if I understand correctly, that y'all are also going to be using for Neon District. Yep, it's the same. It's the same tech stack. We were looking for how to optimize it. Um, where, what are expectations of the load um, that we could handle? What what that could be, and how to improve it. So that's what we were doing with Plasma Bears, and um, we did discover quite a bit, and it was, and it's still up. So that blockchain has, and, and game has been live since uh, January, and it's um, still working. So nothing, nothing's terribly broken. <laughs> so you, you said it's built on the Loom network. So this is the layer two component, or like all the everything that happens in the game is on layer two, and then like things settle down to uh, the Ethereum blockchain, right? Well, so you um, you have the game. There are different components of gameplay that don't have to be um, like blockchain transactions, but it's just when you do something important that like updates a token. That I got gotcha. you. Yeah, that's the that's the blockchain moment. So you can have user experience that's not blockchain, but then but yeah, but it doesn't. There's one second block times, so you could pretty much have all of that experience on the blockchain anyway. Um, but the diff- so Loom Network hat they have their own chains. Um, but another thing that Loom does is they pr- provide an SDK, so you can run your own game chain um, and have complete control over your own network, uh, which mm. is like for us was great because our goal is to get crypto assets into people's hands as fast as possible. From there, they can decentralize their experience. Um, so the plan with Neon District is you start with that custodial wallet centralized experience, but then you can mm. you can basically upgrade your user experience to being more like you're, you're a pro so you could have a completely decentralized experience in, in how you interact with the game um the thought is that a lot of our since we're targeting mainstream we're going to run into people that do really stupid stuff with their assets or their accounts and will want to re-access them or they're going to be generating initially a lot of low value assets that are not that valuable so by the time you get to a place where you're creating higher value assets, you can then go into your settings and change your wallet and change your, like how you're interacting with the application. Um, 
Yeah. yeah, and if a lot of that initial experience is centralized, it gives you much more control on being able to help manage the customer experience for them as well. Exactly. Well, and and you're not requiring them to have all this blockchain education at the start. The the yeah. hope is that you that you you tell them through gameplay when they've created something that might be a mid tier value. Hey, this is something that's valuable. Let me direct you to the marketplace so you could see a similar item that's listed for sale. Look at these other pieces that are trading. You know, because people will want to complete sets, sets of characters, sets of gear, a limited edition, whatever, and um, or like a a party of characters that play strategically in a certain situation. They'll want to create that party. Um, so you might have, let's say, a, a rogue when you really wanted a death knight, and how do you switch those out? And you want to go sell it for a lot of money because it was something you put in a lot of time into, and but then you want to go get this other equally valuable other character. I'm giving a World of Warcraft example. We don't actually have rogues and death, but, <laughs> but anyway, it's like, um, like th- that. As a WoW player, that was something that I always wanted to do. I, it was so annoying mm-hmm. that um, I would build up a character like level 15, and be like, oh, I didn't. That's not really the character I wanted. I don't like how this this character plays or this class plays. I really want this other yeah. class. Or you saw someone else running around on the map in that class, and you're like, oh, I want to. I want to start developing that one and get to there. But you have to start over and then grind in the beginning levels. The lower levels is always just so brutal. Um, yeah. Yeah, it, it would have been really nice. So you to can essentially get. trade. What's that? Uh, you essentially can manage a trade doing it this way, and you're fully within the gameplay. Yep. So trading on the side chain is free in this case. You could you could put something up uh, to offer and uh, because it's delegated proof of stake. Um, yeah, I could put my character up for auction or to barter you can make an offer of a different character and i could decide i want that i could even like list the things i'm looking for in to barter and then someone can make an offer and i can accept it or not um you also have the ability for people just to make offers on your assets without it even being listed for sale which is pretty neat um yeah that's awesome so in the grand scheme of things, one of the things that I heard recently totally blew my mind, and I'm, I might I might misremember part of it, but it was just talking about the size of the gaming industry in general. And someone made a note that it was like bigger than movies and TV combined or something like that in terms of annual revenue generation. Um, that that just it just makes my mind shatter uh, to think about how big of an industry it is. In May, early May, you did a Techstars demo day pitch. In that, you gave like a little mini rundown based on having opened up some component, I think, of Neon District for two weeks. So what was that? Was that a um, just some kind of demo but not fully exposing the game? Like how are y'all exposing the game? And I want to go over the numbers that you cited because it was crazy. Um, yep. So. Um, so we did a founder sale. So we had a we have a ra- rather large community um, that we built over the years, and we wanted to give the opportunities to, to our core community members to really benefit from uh, being a, like backing the project. Um, so the founder sale was it started out as a waiting list, a gamified wait list. Uh, it had fourteen thousand people on it, and in, it, you ha- you could compete to get to the top via money or um, referrals. So we had basically that top 1,000 was uh, social influencers or people that were willing to spend a little bit to get ahead. And then you had, so you took those 1,000 and then you allowed them to participate in a founder sale. Um, the founder sale started out with access to a founder's key and they could buy it or not for $5. So if they bought that founder's key, which was ranked uh, according one to 1,000, and the number one key had a better loot drop rate for what would be the founder's sale, that would be the next step. So if you mm. had the number one key and you had been first on the wait list, then when you entered the sale and you'd have first access to the sale, um, you were going to get a better loot drop than anybody else in line. So so we people bought their keys or they didn't buy their keys uh, for $5. And then when they, the sale started, it was about a week, a uh, week and a half, and it was a gated to the different tiers. There were four different tiers. Uh, and... Um, people would spend $10 on a chest and the chest would have four assets in it. Um, these are founders assets. So they're, like think of them as digital art collectibles in the sense that 
they were the only time you were going to get them, and it meant that you were going to be recognized as a founder or OG for holding these assets. Um, okay. And there were different, uh, so there was legendary, ultra rare, rare, and so on, um, the five different categories of these assets. So our, our users um, then bought the, the first uh, tier, you know, the most committed, obviously had the higher spend than everybody else. But we ended up selling $120,000 worth of these assets in that time frame. But the cool part is that that then flipped immediately into a $3.2 million market cap. Which, uh, so our users had a 2,500% ROI on their investment. So even though the participation had a user spend, they all made a ton of money if they wanted to realize those gains. A lot of these users though also just want to hold them because they have a lot of sentimental value and they believe in the project and the um, the reputational status that these assets bring them is also meaningful. Um, so yeah, so I guess like that was that was the founder sale, and then um, these keys gave our users they they actually contribute to almost a governance type system, in that it allows if you have this key in your wallet, it gave you access to the private forum in which you could get feedback on the pre-alpha builds that we were shipping. What we called the founders program it was a six-week program. Every Friday was a new build to get review on from the the founders. Um, we were looking for certain information, certain types of feedback. We were asking for contributions about content or uh, world building, lore, story. And um, and then people that participated also were given kudos and um, shout outs. We had uh, weekly updates about this. So that, um, and the pre-alpha was a way to really get some solid feedback. So the actual game though, so and it was a tutorial part of the game. So season zero, consider it it's like the first hour of gameplay. And okay. And then the season one is 30 hours of 30 to 35 hours of campaign play. Oh, so campaign story. But then there's also procedural missions that happen on top of that. So the game itself will have hundreds of hours of possible gameplay. Um, well, it would really be un uncapped in that sense. But that comes out December 2nd. So uh, on December 2nd, we, uh, which is Cyber Monday, is the, is the goal to launch season one. But we'll be working directly with these founders all the way through. So while the founders program has concluded, we're still shipping builds constantly, and they still have access to the latest build by holding the founders key. Um, so okay. those founders keys, like the top twenty, are called God keys, and they're all specially labeled. They changed changed hands for a, a few like thousands. I think that, I can't remember how much was the. I think the twenty two ETH or twenty four ETH. Something like that. Maybe uh, number two key changed hands for that much. Um, but season zero boss also had uh, was an asset. It's like a, it's considered a celebrity asset. It's this t tentacle looking mechanical figure um, that you experience at the end of the tutorial. He is uh, he sold for twenty five thousand dollars during an auction similar to the one I'm doing with my painting, and and that asset will give the owner the owner's building experiences for this celebrity asset outside of our game um, to up its utility and create uh, additional value for it but then he will also be renting the asset so anybody in the community could be the boss owner for a day to play with it in different in different games and experiences and um that's awesome yeah yeah so we're i mean that's one thing at blockade is that we really are playing around on that the just the the fringe technology of what is just now possible we integrated the lightning network with ethereum smart contracts for this game that we're launching we're launching a game next week called ledger of zabo um which is a, a pay to play game because it has a bitcoin prize in it so there's levels of puzzles and it's it is a legend of zelda inspired type game but it's also crypto themed um and the art is all redone but you know the experience is a, is a play off of that but you unlock levels and puzzles and as you solve them you can you can get kickbacks a little bitcoin prizes um but you also have to if you lose all your lives for example you might have to do microtransactions to for another life similar to an arcade um and but they're all also be minting nfts via the lightning network and your gameplay uh so you could get <laughs> cool nft uh, sprites that are tradable from the experience as well so i have a Super noob question. Um, when you have the finished RPG, uh, are people going to be playing live against each other or do you play a campaign like a single player against the game? How does the gameplay work? 
So we, we, we're we doing an iterative design in that uh, season one is it's you versus the uh, environment, which, you know, the, the computer, it's the campaign. Mm-hmm. Um, then season two, which is six months later, is cooperative. So we're introducing a new game mode. And then season three is introducing PvP. And that said, so that would be uh, the next year. Um, that way we have enough time to, because each of those game modes uh, requires quite a bit of engineering. Uh, <laughs> I imagine it's like exponentially more complicated. Everybody wait for it all to be ready at once. It's It's just better for us to ship as fast as possible, the different modes as they're ready. And I could it, be wrong, but this seems unique in the sense of like this iterative release cycle for a game relative to, you know, like when some of these gigantic game companies come out, they come out and it's like, here's the game, you know, like it's got all this stuff going on. Is that, I'm mean, some of that has to just be practical, like to be able to keep shipping, keep getting feedback. But also, I mean, I imagine it's really spurring along this community spirit about it, right? Because people are having their input, their response to each of these releases is giving you information to improve the game make it better for them right there's that and then it's also so they're they're asset holders so they're almost like direct investors so i think um something that when you look at traditional games and how they have to launch with all the content mostly at once is because your user drop-off is just gigantic um Mm. from when you launch a game and it's long tail there's there's no way to really keep people invested in coming back fortnite uh does a pretty good job with the seasons with uh introducing new tournaments uh events and then see like the, with each season there's new skins but even then they're having a hard time retaining these users because there's competitor games that come out that are similar maybe a little better maybe a little different a little more interesting um one thing that fortnite really does well is the cross-platform gaming so you like i could play i could be on my computer you could be on your xbox somebody else is on mm-hmm. mobile actually i don't know if mobile is a part of the same system, but PlayStation. But from different ecos, different types of consoles right. and whatnot. Exactly, and we're all playing the same match. So, for example, you can't do that with CS:GO. Um, everybody's got to be on the same platform. Uh, so, so yeah. So there's like, how do you bring people together in a way that they can play and have fun? Um, and yeah, so traditional games have to launch and be really impressive from the get-go. Otherwise, I, they get all these bad reviews and then nobody wants to play their game. Um, in our case, if we're launching really gradually and people are in, basically becoming a part of the game company by being asset holders and contributing in the way that is still fun with open source communities and peer production that I personally really love, um, allowing you to embrace the strengths of your community and all grow it together, I, 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 I don't see how we could really do it a different way. We don't have the, we're not a gigantic game company with, uh, you know, an $8 million budget to to make this game. We have to do it in a way that we're bringing in monetization gradually and then reiterating and, and uh, making cool new assets that we can sell, but also provide new content for the users. So users can then have that secondary markets markup sale um, and they're making money too. So yeah, it's just like a group effort to, make the experience and really capture the value that we're trying to introduce this new type of, of game. Um, some people call it earn to play as opposed to free to play. So you hmm. er, yeah, you're earning, earning value as you're, as you're playing. Wait, so how do you it, guys, it might be play to earn. I might've just screwed up. Play to earn. Yeah. Play to earn. Yeah, that play makes to sense. Earn. <laughs> Sorry. So how do you make money off of this? Do you take <laughs> three or 4% or something off of transactions in game or how does that work? <clears throat> So on the on the uh, peer-to-peer trading side, we we're not taking a cut. Um, so you we have those uh, the different monetization vectors are basically like the limited edition skins that can happen as basically you're selling digital art, um, but then also consumables. So when you buy things that help your gameplay experience and increase your ability to um, I guess scale up your assets faster or more effectively, uh, people generally will spend money there and that funnels into the value of their assets that they're working on. Um, but so I can buy to, a sword or something. Right. You need the, the whole point of that though, is you don't have to do that. That's just a vector in which if you want to bypass some different work or, or strategically, because you can buy consumables, but still not using them strategically and it doesn't really help you. Um, so that's a monetization vector, but then uh, yeah, I guess, 
I mean, those are, it's pretty much just the free to play model, but in allowing the community to also benefit, which makes the entire experience a little more defensible. Um, and, and, and that we were talking about has longer user retention. Does the community also have the opportunity to create stuff that can then be used somehow in the game? Um, so almost like there's a in-game marketplace. So I can mm-hmm. play I can play to earn, but maybe I can also create stuff that can be add to the user experience in the game that can I can also earn. Is that part of it? Yeah, and that's that's another one of the reasons why we wanted to do the two D uh, art was so that we have these files essentially that you could paint. You could paint and then, mm. and then submit to the game. Uh, we approve it. And then you, we could work together. To, let's say you're a guest artist or um, like a special guest and you want to make 10 of something. Then we would work together to figure out that distribution, how you're going to sell them, um, where they live in the game. But yeah, absolutely. that's going to be more, that pipeline initially will be pretty centralized. Um, the goal eventually is to build it up in a way, though, that you could have a de- decentralized submission process that will just require a bit of work to, to yeah. implement. Yeah, that's but, awesome. And there's a the, the gameplay, the last one of the teaser videos that I saw, and this was a couple months ago, but it had some crypto themes in it as well. Are y'all maintaining that or are you making the concept of cryptocurrency not really a big part of the gameplay in order to help make it mainstream? Are you talking about the like cinematic trailer that was all blue? Yeah. Yeah, that went so that was yeah, our initial. So we when we shared that on Reddit, we got a ton of pushback from mainstream people about the crypto association. So um if we have crypto um we'll, we'll probably have little things like that will be subtle. It won't be in your maybe game. you don't collect gold, you collect uh, some kind of cryptocurrency, like if you're powering up in the game or something like that. No, I was more thinking like corporations, you know, um, there's different types of corporations that you could have a play on words that you give a place and, or a character's name that might be a play. Okay. But um, the goal is to make this mainstream and to be inclusive. So, and know. I mean, we do have our background with making the crypto memes and meme games, um, but I with this product, it kind of it feels like it doesn't fit directly anymore to do that. Um, yeah, but we'll we'll probably. I mean, you can expect that we'll have Easter eggs, and for example, holding a key will allow you in-game content access to in-game content or experiences that you wouldn't otherwise have, um, and we'll have. Or if you have a certain type of character, you might you, you could see a door maybe that you otherwise wouldn't be able to see. There's a lot of fun we can do with having the game reading the assets in your wallet and then how that directly impacts your gameplay. Oh, wow. Yeah. So uh, in a mainstream sense, I wanted to just kind of understand what is even the – what are the limits here? Because obviously this the gaming world is huge and there's all these different – types of games and you mentioned darkest dungeon as a 2d game uh just looking at this the basics of this it's got like fifty thousand reviews on steam it's distributed through the steam network um so obviously this thing's generated millions of dollars in revenue for a, a 2d game so you're not really limiting your audience by saying it's 2d and i imagine maybe someday like you said you could turn it into a uh, a 3d gameplay and when right. you're making it not just crypto, like your ceiling on this is whoever the whoever the mainstream gaming audience is, you can capture that at the at, at the top end of of this uh, adventure, right? Well, the last thing you want to do is build something that's too. I mean, we already were really ambitious by doing an RPG. So yeah, um, last thing you want to do is try to do a gigantic behemoth of a game that's going to take five years to um, to create. And then your blockchain platform is completely outdated. So right now we're <laughs> yeah. iterating on the blockchain tech at the same time. I mean, it's constantly changing as well. So um, we're optimizing that just every couple months. I mean, something new is happening. So like shipping as fast as possible is really the only way to do this because of the tech stack. Um, and and also we're not trying to compete with those 3D games. We're trying to introduce a new type of experience, which like you said, um, in the 2D the 2D world, the comic world, I mean, our user and who we're targeting is 
pretty on board with this style of game. Uh, we're not yeah. going to be, for example, attracting a first person shooter type player. It's just, right. like, but people that enjoy card games or um, strategy games or puzzle type games, they'll, they'll enjoy this type of game. And it's such a big ecosystem. There's a, there's already a market for that. You're not inventing that market. You're just providing a whole new angle for it. Well, and the collectible market, like I said in that video is $200 billion. Um, yeah. Wow. But bigger than gaming. So, I mean, you're, you can be That's tapping crazy. into the collectible type of user <laughs> in general, someone that yeah. just wants to collect all those limited editions and never wants to play. Um, there may, may be some of that who, and then later want to resell it as a brand new asset from the, the first generation. Um, hmm. uh, but y'all are, yeah, there are so many things that you're doing. Uh, it's hard for me to grasp it all. Uh, and you're approaching it differently. Like most of the time when I hear like people are doing some kind of game angle in crypto, it feels like they're trying to do some platform or some baseline currency that they want like all these other game developers to just adopt. Whereas you're just kind of building the experience and then building crypto into it. Like I, you haven't said anything about a, a coin for, you know, your game or anything like that. Like you're building NFTs, you're building gameplay establishing value throughout that i think that's extremely smart when it does come to distribution when it does come to encouraging um this transferability of assets for people that want to build something where they can take you know if i create the ledger monster uh in your game and then i want to translate that to another game how are you establishing those relationships how are you managing game distribution is it all through your your own site your own platform are you partnering for distribution what's all that that stuff look like yep so we're working on actually there's a publisher over in asia that uh we're talking to um blockchain gaming by the way in asia is much uh moving much faster than it is mm. in the u.s blockchain in general is just moving faster in asia um but uh, so our plan is to distribute on, we're going to be on Steam uh, as a PC game. Okay. And then from there, we've already been designing with mobile in mind. So we, we've built in Unity. Um, so we, then we, the next play would be mobile. And then after that, I'd really like to get the game on Switch. Wow. But that's, um, yeah. So I mean, that's currently the strategy. And the fact that we are non fungible tokens, like we don't have any fungible assets, we can be in the, the different mobile stores without any problem there's wow yeah because we're not we're not we're not requiring a crypto interaction uh in order to play the game that's amazing so someone you go through uh steam and you're you're talking about the potential to be basically on any platform and right. since it's free to start like there's very little barrier here for someone to try the game yeah that's right and um so yeah, so Epic, Epic, we would like to be on Epic as well, their new store. Because of the, that's awesome. Yeah, it's not a saturated. But so yeah, that's the plan. So people are flocking to you. Obviously, you talked about uh, team members from Sony, Blizzard, Valve, Disney. They left extremely large, successful gaming companies and platforms to work at a startup. Uh, <laughs> you raised, <laughs> you raised some money um, already. Uh, I think you closed. When did you close that? Maybe sometime in 2018 or 20, early 2019 or. Yep. 2018. 2018. 800,000. And right now we're currently, um, we're fundraising again. So uh, I've been, I've been working on that, which is um, it's, you know, it's not fast. It's not, and we're not, since we're not doing an ICO or that, any. Yeah. That, Thank goodness. Yeah. Well, it's tough though, because a lot of blockchain investors want you to have something that's going to give them instant liquidity. What a lot of yeah. blockchain investors haven't realized yet, which some are realizing, is that the secondary sale is also a great investment. Um, buying the initial asset, asset and what they make on the secondary sale. I mean, across the board with non-fungible assets, people are seeing a 10x um, just on average on their return. So, wow. yeah. So, I mean, it's a, it's currently it's unsaturated market. Um, people that are backing the content creators and then instead of trying to figure out a use case for some token, like we just, we don't need it. We don't need a token right now. Um, maybe in the future with the platform, maybe that will make sense, but currently- I can't tell you how refreshing that is to hear. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, all I've You've done... been in the space many more years than me, so I'm sure for you, like you've seen it all. Uh, yeah. You know, your skepticism is probably to the max. So um, 
I can't think yeah. of any platform that said, oh, you have to do some X, Y, Z with this token in order to experience the application. I mean, I can't, as a design user experience, that's just the, the worst thing ever that, I mean, yeah. It, yeah. So anyways, um, so we'll see, we'll see what happens. I think that, I think that people are just realizing the potential now of these digital assets and get, educating the masses on, for example, they don't need to think of them as non-fungible tokens. That's probably going to be a phase that, or a term that phases out. It's probably just going to be people talking about digital game assets and not re I mean, you don't talk about the backend tech stack for big games in general. Yeah. Um, usually you just know that you have certain functions and that you can craft, you cannot craft, you can trade, you cannot trade. I mean, yeah. So. And then I want to, I'll finish with this. I've held you a long time because I basically wanted to do two different interviews <laughs> uh, here. I want to get involved today. What do I, what do I do? Can I, can I go buy a key from somebody, a founder's key, or can I sign up for an email and figure out some way to like, you know, squeeze my way in and start earning and become part of this community? How are you encouraging people to get involved? So um, our discord has, something like 5,000, we have 5,000 people on our Discord. Um, it's a great place to come and hang out and get updates. We have a mailing list. So if you go to neondistrict.io, there's a place to submit for your uh, mailing list. And we do send out newsletters um, about our development. Um, and our Twitter, our Twitter uh, is Neon District RPG. We, we're we very active on there as well. Um, we do respond. So if anyone's interested or has any inquiries, you can just ping us. Um, but yeah. I, I would say the best place though is Discord as far as like being involved as a community member. And yes, you can buy a key, a founder's key on OpenSea. Um, they're not cheap though. I I mean, I think the, the cheapest key is like $30. So yeah, it, yeah. I mean, but you can try. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the whole thing is just, I, th I think you're onto something really, really big. Uh, obviously some other folks have agreed. I know you, uh, I know people in my audience, they may know several, may know some of the people that have, uh, already invested in you, but block tower and, and pink ski capital. And, uh, you went through tech stars, um, hodl capital. I don't know that one, but I love the name. Um, but okay. you know, you've got some yeah. great people involved and it seems like you're, you're onto a really big thing here. I won't be surprised if in two years, uh, you know, like you're just, you're building things that you couldn't have imagined that I certainly am not Im able to imagine today. Um, people need to go to blockade.games to learn more about the company. Uh, individually, you have a lot of other stuff going on, but neondistrict.io is the big one that you're uh, building with the RPG game. And okay. then personally on Twitter, uh, you're at coin artist and I need to confirm, yes, there's an underscore in the middle of, of yeah. that. So coin underscore artist and don't forget for people that are uh still listening to check out the auction um for torched hearts and like i'm the biggest noob i was i looked at the hearts component of this because it's h34 r7 s i must have looked at it 10 times and not realized that it spelled hearts <laughs> so uh this has been an educational interview for me because um, you know, I, I have a ton to learn about the gaming world, but I do think that this is a huge application for crypto. The, the pitch that you give of being able to transfer assets to earn assets and keep them, not throw away your, your level 70 character that you worked on for four years. Um, it's just a huge, it's, it, it's a huge and obvious win. So I think you're, I think you're going to be enormously successful and I'm really looking forward to watching it. So thank oh, you for joining thank me you. so much. I really Thanks appreciate for, it. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and uh, I guess we will uh, catch everybody next time. Monuments crumble in the blink 